evening. I'm Tom Putnam, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of Tom McNaught, executive director of the Kennedy Library Foundation, and all of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming and acknowledge the generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, including the Lowell Institute, represented tonight by Bill and Angela Lowell, Bank of America, Boston Capital, Raytheon, the Boston Foundation, and our media partners, the Boston Globe and WBUR. I'm hesitant to say too much in my introduction, since our interest this evening is in hearing directly from Margaret Marshall about her life and career. But please allow me to help set the table for at least one portion of the conversation, which also helps explain one of the many reasons why it is fitting for us to host this conversation. In 1966, as a young student and vice chair of the National Union of South African Students, dedicated to ending apartheid, Margaret Marshall invited and later served as host to Senator Robert F. Kennedy as he toured her native homeland. Let's watch two brief film clips from a film about that historic visit. The first is as RFK is landing at the airport, and the second from his most famous speech during that trip. There were places for whites, there were places for what the government referred to as non-whites, and never the twain mixed. And there we all were gathered in Johannesburg, awaiting his arrival. They arrived at John Smart's airport, which had uh, those signs, non-whites only and whites only. He chose to go to the non-white area. That's where they put his podium. I don't think anybody anticipated that hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people made their way to that airport, which was a long way outside Johannesburg. There was no public transportation. Black South Africans, very few of them, had access to automobiles. When Kennedy came, this person from almost out of space, really, when, when something like that happens to a people who are bottled up and oppressed, it, it sends through an, an electric shot through the communities of the coming of, of freedom. The airport was swarming with white, black, brown, Indian, every hue of skin. I don't think I had ever seen anything like that in my life. And so that very first night, we began to get an inkling of what this visit was going to entail. Well, the speech Robert Kennedy gave on that occasion was certainly the most important speech of his life. And I think it captured the essence of, of what he stood for and came to be known for when he ran for president particularly that one paragraph about the ripple of hope, which has just been quoted over and over and over again. Each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. At the end of that speech, I remember as if he stopped and looked around as if to say, was that enough? As you can imagine, there are many perks to my job, but the moments I often best remember are not what you might expect. I happened to be seated next to Tony Lewis when we first aired this film at a Kennedy Library forum that featured, among others, his wife, Chief Justice Marshall. And he simply could not contain his pride. That's Margie there, he leaned over to tell me. Look, there she is again, right behind Ethel. <laughs> Though none of us know Margie as well as Tony, we too at times take pride in her accomplishments. There she is, as we've just seen her fighting for racial equality, or advocating for family-friendly work cultures in support of professional women, and there again, being appointed this Commonwealth's first female Chief Justice, urging the legislator to dedicate more funding for our judicial system, and urging the rest of us to depoliticize how judges are selected. And look, there again, and perhaps most famously, writing the decision that declared that the Massachusetts Constitution 
does not permit our state to deny citizens the right to same-sex marriage. And, most recently, announcing her retirement from the court so that, in her words, Tony and I may enjoy our final season together. A remarkable life. Our moderator this evening, Linda Greenhouse, has also had an illustrious and noteworthy career. Currently, senior research scholar, journalist in residence, and lecturer at Yale Law School, Ms. Greenhouse covered the Supreme Court for the New York Times between 1978 and 2008, earning the Pulitzer Prize in 1998 and the Goldsmith Career Award for Excellence in Journalism in 2004. One imagines that Boston's two newspapers, both The Globe and The Herald, may regret having not even offered her an interview after her graduation from Radcliffe, as they were not interested at the time in hiring female reporters. I've noticed that when Chief Justice Marshall is approached by those whose lives she has touched, especially those who wish to thank her for upholding their right to marry their beloved, she often replies with self-effacement and sincere interest, tell me your story. Tonight, we pause to publicly thank you, Margaret Marshall, for your service to our Commonwealth and to the common good. It's your turn now. Tell us your story. hard to top that introduction. I'm very happy to be back here on this stage. Uh, Margie Marshall and I have known each other for more than 25 years. But, you know, when you know somebody socially, you don't sit down, sit them down for an interview. So I actually do have, you know, questions oh, good. that I never <laughs> in a social setting would have asked you. So take, we'll, we'll do this kind of chronologically, I think. I mean, it, you, you haven't written a memoir. I hope you're thinking of doing that. I have no idea whether you are, but I'm, I'm sure you could find a publisher. And I'm thinking, so we'll I'm thinking, I'm not writing. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back to uh, what that fabulous film clip reminded us of your start in South Africa. And I'm assuming, without actually knowing, but I did, I did know your mother a tiny bit uh, when she was living in Cambridge with you. I assume you had a pretty comfortable life in South Africa. You went to the best university. Um, you had various plans, and I assume at some point in your life you just assumed you would, you would stay there. Uh, well, how, how did the Marshall family end up in South Africa? What, what, were, your, what were the origins of the family? I, c I come from a rather unusual family uh, in this sense. Both of my grandmothers were Afrikaners. Both of my grandfathers were um, uh, from you know, English uh, descendants. And it's sometimes, you know, when you meet those Italian-Irish families or Jewish Christian families and you've got two in each, I think the fact that I didn't come from all one side or all the other made, probably brought my parents together. But I, came, I lived in a very um, typical uh, white family. Um, I grew up in a very, very tiny um, town, in a way. And my only interaction, I mean, my only interaction with black South Africans was our servants. Um, and I haven't seen the maid, but I suspect that relationships are not that different. Um, I never knew, I never called any black South African by their uh, full name. And I probably didn't call them by their correct name because the standard operating procedure, at least where I was growing up, was somebody would come in and, and ask to be employed. And if her name was, you know, Mampela Ramfela, who's a great friend, you know, the white um, woman of the house would say, that's too big, difficult, we'll call you Jane. Mm -hmm. So I grew up knowing James and Johns and Marys and mm -hmm. um, just, I mean, that, that was all. Knew nothing about their families, knew nothing, didn't know whether they were married. Had absolutely no interaction whatsoever. Uh, black South Africans lived over there in a separate place. And so at what point did that strike you as odd and not right? Well, striking me as odd and not right um, is a double question. Um, I remember the first time wondering why. I grew up as an Episcopalian, and for those of you who know the Episcopalian church, you all drink from the same chalice. 
and all the whites had to go first because you could never follow a black person drinking from the chalice. So the services were, it was the same service, the black uh, members of the congregation sat at the back and they could never, and all of course the priests and everybody else was white, the choir was white, the choral mistress was white, the organist was white, and there were some people at the black, at the back. Um, and that's, that's what I remember from my earliest childhood, thinking that's strange, um, because those were people who were part of the church. But I, it didn't strike me as wrong, it was just a question. Mm -hmm. Um, then I went to school in Johannesburg, and it was a very, un it was a different school <coughs> in the sense it was an all-girls, all-white school, but it was for its time a quite liberal school. A boarding school. A boarding school. Um, and there were several English, as in from England, teachers, and one of the things at that school that we had to do was to learn to address the African staff by their full names. That was the first time that ever anybody had ever suggested that I should call somebody Miss Greenhouse or whatever the name was. Um, and the other thing that the school did, which was really quite awkward if you can think about it, is we had exchanges with black students from the townships, those parts of Johannesburg where blacks lived. There were some Episcopalian and Catholic church schools. Mm -hmm. And I remember those as being terribly awkward. I mean, they just were awful in a funny kind of way. We never went to the black schools. They always brought the black children to meet us. And when I say brought them, you know, maybe three or four times uh, in my four years of being at the school. So there was very little interaction. They would just come through the day or they would? Afternoon tea. Yeah, right. So they weren't <laughs> living. Afternoon tea. It was hard enough to have afternoon tea with your yeah. own friends, yet alone to have, you know, I mean, students who came from really very um, deprived backgrounds and I can't imagine what it was like for them to come to these beautiful grounds, you know, with rolling lawns and swimming pools and tennis courts and science lab and books everywhere. I mean, I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine what they took away from that. Um, and yet, as you know, I mean, 40, 50 years later, you know, there's so little resentment. I mean, I think I would have been massively resentful. Um, my first real, um, so just jumping ahead, I think two things hadn't, so that clearly had some impact on me. Um, uh, I think the thing that probably had the greatest impact on me was I came as a high school exchange student to the United States in 1968. Uh, and I lived with a family in Delaware and I have become such a profound believer in exchange programs uh, for students of that age. Now, it's probably not as important today because m modes of communication are so much easier. But for me to come to the United States and just to see a different world, um, I was placed with a very conservative Republican family in Delaware. They were obviously trying to match my family background. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but and Delaware had a good deal of racial separation. Oh, it was completely se segregated. But President Kennedy was in the White House and my American family, who I grew to love, were wonderful with me. They took me to Washington. Uh, Rogers Morton was a great Republican congressman, and he took me to the White House, um, and I went to Valley Forge. But mostly what I did was to watch the evening news, Walter Cronkite. I mean, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that people could talk about their president uh, the way Americans were talking about their president. Um, I went again to an all-girls school and I was taught how to read the New York Times. You know, we were told that on the, you know, the main story is on the front page, the right-hand column, <coughs> that the Tiffany ad is always on page two. It was always <laughs> interesting to me <laughs> that they pointed out where well, did you know you'd be marrying the New York Times? <laughs> um, so I, and, I w and I actually learned more about South Africa here in the United States in that mm. year. Um, because so many books have been banned. I read Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton. Um, but mostly it was watching the civil rights movement. I mean, people demanding their rights. You know, listening to Martin, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, listening, uh, you know, to... Um, I was here during the Cuban uh, crisis, and it was just a... I think it just blew my mind without realizing at the time how expensive mm -hmm. education is. So it's wonderful. 
And then you went back and went to college. Then I went back. I'd actually started um, at university because the academic year in South Africa, because it's the, the Southern Hemisphere, runs from January to December, not September to uh, uh, you know, June, July. Uh, so I had done one semester of college. I thought I was going to be a world-famous pianist. So I started studying for a music degree, and then I was taken to Carnegie Hall, and I decided I was not going to be a world <laughs> pianist. Um, and what I discovered, um, which I didn't know much about, was um, that I loved the history of art. We had a wonderful art teacher, and so I went back and studied art. But still, I, I would not say I was political at all. But it's an interesting thing. Um, when somebody takes the blinders off your eyes, it's very hard to put them back on again. And so I think when I went back, I started noticing things. And it didn't surprise me uh, that I became active in the student movement, although not in a leadership capacity. I mean, I was, I was then and still am, but I, I really was a girl, and I thought what I was going to do was uh, go to university. My father was not terribly supportive of my going to university. I mean, he didn't oppose it, but he thought it was something of a waste of time. Um, but the, the, the game plan was go to university, meet somebody, and marry them, and that was it. Right, that and was true over here, too. <laughs> and somehow I took a little bit of an odd, an odd turn. So you did become a student leader in an environment where, I mean, did women typically step forward to lead anything in those days? No. And the only reason why I became a student leader was because, um, so we're talking 1954, 65, 66. If you think that that's the period when the boot came down heaviest on the African National Congress, the Pan-African Congress, the Communist Party, Nelson Mandela and all of his people went to prison for life, just about anybody who was political was either in prison or banned, and we can talk a little bit about what banned means, or out of the country. Um, and um, so it was an interesting time because at the university, the, the economists, the social scientists, the political scientists, almost all of those had been either outlawed or banned or left the country. And so we were left with art historians and teachers of English, no historians. Um, and essentially the student movement kind of uh, bubbled up again. Um, it's very hard to keep the people down forever. And student activity turned out to be the place where there was the bubbling up. Um, and essentially what the South African government did was just you know, clip off the heads of every student leader who stuck his head above. Um, and just one by one they went to prison or they were banned. Now what does banning mean? Banning means you have an order issued by the Minister of Justice that says that you can, that you can find to your home. It's essentially a form of house arrest and you can only be in, your, in a room in your home with one other person. So you can't go to university, you can't teach, you can't be a lawyer, you can't, uh, you can't go to a movie, you can't go to a football game, you can't... House arrest. Essentially yeah. house arrest, so even in your own home, you can't attend a birthday party or your grand, you know, whatever it is. And essentially that's what was happening to all of the student leaders. And uh, Senator Kennedy was invited, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy was invited by the National Union of Students, and the consequence of that invitation was that the president of New SAS was banned. Um, oh. And so I was sort of left stand, you know, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean me? <laughs> um, and so I why didn't you just go hide under your bed? I mean, that's a very vulnerable. Well, Can I interrupt you? So what did people not hear? Should we repeat? Okay. All right. I could see the people at the back who were beginning to hear. Okay. And if you can't hear, just raise your hand and then I'll know uh, okay. that you can't hear, but that's much better. So Thanks. instead of hiding under your bed, you step forward. Yes, and that's, that's, that's a difficult 
decision to know why. Um, I think I should say a little bit about my mother at this point. My mother was not political, um, but she was extraordinarily supportive throughout my career with what I wanted to do. And I remember telephoning her because it hadn't occurred to me that I would become the president. I just assumed that one of the other men would become the president. And as we went around the room, it turned out that for whatever reason, nobody was able to do it. Um, and I remember telephoning her and saying, what, am I, you know, what should I do? And in that wonderful way that mothers can, she said, darling, what would you like to do? <laughs> I said, I don't know. And she said, well, do you think that you should do this? And I said, I think so. And she said, well, then do it. And that was, you know, for those of you who've had, and I've, there's so many wonderful friends here in the audience, but I've seen Paula Mary McNamara, they remember my mother. I mean, that's very, very Hillary. I mean, she didn't have, my mother is Hillary, she didn't have an agenda for me. She was just so supportive of me if that's what I thought I wanted to do. In retrospect, um, I realize how hard it was for my parents. It, my father was very distressed about this. I think not because he was politically a reactionary, he was just afraid for his daughter. And so, and there were no women other than, no white women other than Helen Sussman, you know, who were active in this kind of anti-apartheid work. There were other student leaders, but this was a pretty visible position. And I think, um, Next time I was Miss Remember, I said to somebody, I'm no longer a Chief Justice, I don't have to wear a suit. Well, it turns out <laughs> <laughs> it will be helpful to wear a suit. <laughs> Let's remember that. Right. I'm, I'm learning what it's like not to be a Chief Justice. Um, you can't so cover it up with a robe either. So, it, so there I was, um, you know, in this quite amazing situation, but I think my experience in life has always been that if you step out onto that high wire and you, and you somehow keep your balance, it provides such a wonderful opportunity. And so I had an opportunity to meet people, all kinds of people, and including black South Africans who were just so kind and patient with me, um, teaching me about their lives. But I think in that year, it was almost two years, I just learned an enormous amount. I mean, there were moments that were frightening and terrifying, but somehow, you know, human beings managed to push that um, aside. We'd never heard of things like post-traumatic stress syndrome, but I never once had a nightmare uh, in the United States. I mean, in South Africa, and as soon as I arrived in the United States, I started having nightmare after nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. And I think those of you who've been through pretty difficult situations will recognize that. Um, I mean, you now have a name for it. So you just do what you have to do in some kind of way. And then you left the country. Did you, what, what if you had stayed? Would you have gone into politics or what do you think? You know, I'd never thought of becoming a lawyer. Um, I don't know what I would have done because there was no obvious role. I certainly did not agree with the party that Helen Sussman represented. I mean, I, I, by that stage, I believed powerfully in one person, one vote. And the party that she represented believed in a so-called qualified vote, namely you gave the vote to all white people and only educated black people. and that seem, um, I mean, I, I think I, I had a pretty good sense of civil liberties by then, so I don't think the party would have provided it. I think if I had remained active, um, I would have had a choice, as everybody did, about whether you continued legal activities, which I was engaged in, or illegal activities. Um, I think that had I stayed, I surely would have, um, you know, run into much more direct opposition from the South African government. 
it, it's clear to me in retrospect that two things worked in my favor. The one was being white, of course. I mean, whites were just always better treated. So white political prisoners were always better treated. Whites could get away with much more than blacks would get away with. Uh, but the second was my gender. I mean, I, they just didn't know how to deal with me. Um, and I think that made it uh, much harder than, because almost all of the um, student leaders who were men either left the country or were banned or were arrested. They were involved in USA. So I think it's you know, a place where my gender really did work to protect me. It was some time later, the next woman uh, president of the National Union of Students uh, was arrested. Um, you know, it takes a while for totalitarian governments to figure out wh who these uppity women are, and they finally <laughs> figured it out. And <laughs> so, was it clear to you at a certain point that you were going to have to leave? Oh, no, not at all. Not how, at did all. That, how did you become an immigrant? I, I, w I didn't become an immigrant. Um, I came on a scholarship to Harvard. Uh, and there again, I think I, um, I was, my parents couldn't possibly have afforded to send me and a group of people who felt very protective of me essentially provided me, me with a scholarship because it was very clear that I was running close to the edge. Um, and so they provided me with a scholarship uh, to come to Harvard. And then uh, while I was at Harvard, um, I started became very active in the anti-apartheid movement here. And then there's a little bit of history. Um, the main thrust of the anti-apartheid movement here at that time was sanctions, uh, asking universities and churches and others to divest from South Africa, uh, asking the United States not to extend loans, asking banks not to extend loans to the white government in South Africa. That activity was treasonable activity that I had been engaged in in South Africa was not reasonable. That was, advocating sanctions was reasonable. And so once I started engaging in that activity in the United States, I knew that if I went back again, um, you know, I was just asking to be arrested. But it wasn't clear to me that I would remain in the United States. I mean, the United States was about as far away from South Africa. I mean, the natural place would have been um, England, I guess, to go to England. Yeah. Maybe Canada or Australia, part of the common market. And I remember sitting sort of thinking, well, Australia would be nice. You know, how about Canada? Too cold. And I mean, your mother went to England at a certain point. Uh, later, yeah. she went after my father died. But it was a long, long way from South Africa. Um, I had uh, one of my friends uh, who, there were, you know, a group of us, very small group of South Africans who were here. And there were four women, more or less the same age, Linda sitting in the front row, and we all moved here at about the same time, and we have had Christmas every single year since 1968. The nice thing about them is the other three were Jewish, so we've done it my way for, <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. But we literally, I mean, we were the only ones, then we acquired husbands, and then there were children, and then a grandparent would come up. I mean, we were in a classic immigrant way, the four South African women, you know, were um, our little immigrant community. Um, Sounds like a good novel, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so what really happened in the United States? Um, because I was active in the anti-apartheid movement um, and in the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam war movement, and in the women's movement, I started traveling across the United States. And I developed a love affair with this country. I mean, a real deep love affair with the United States, which I still have. I think if I had remained in Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138, um, I'm not so sure I would have stayed. But it was when I was in Nebraska and meeting people who were making very serious decisions about whether or not their son would go to Canada uh, or, you know, accept the draft or, you know, what, I mean, there was, there was just a discussion of the issues that I cared about, how you craft a coherent civil society which is open to all. The civil rights movement was taking off, the women's movement was taking off, and I think I came to understand 
fact, this was a place that I really did feel very at home, in which I really did feel very at home. And so uh, then there's, you know, that period, 70, 71, 72, 73, it's all a bit of a mush in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was clear, um, you know, that, that something was taking hold. And then I decided to go to law school, not because um, I wanted to become a lawyer. I had discovered that I was not a serious scholar. <coughs> I mean, but I should tell you that I arrived on the Harvard campus in the fall of 1968, and Harvard went on strike in the fall, in the spring of 1969, and somehow being cloistered in the Fogg Museum looking at medieval manuscripts, which is what I thought I was going to spend my time doing, just didn't fit with me at that time. Um, and so I was sort of lost. And I love to tell young people, you know, age 21, 22, 23, 24, if they don't quite know what they're going to do with their lives, don't worry. Just don't panic. I mean, I started at law school when I was 29. Uh, Which today is not uncommon, but then it was quite then I felt uncommon. very old. There were four <coughs> older women in the class, my class. They were always called the four older women. <laughs> um, Elka Wasserman was 55. I, I, I know her. <laughs> and then there were two others. Uh, then there was one other in her late 30s, and Beverly Hodgson and I were 29, and we were just the older women. Um, Out of how many women? Not too many. Mm, maybe... 20? Uh, yeah, 20, 30, something like yeah. that. So, and it, was, it was wonderful. So, I mean, this has been a, a wonderful, wonderful country um, for me, and it saddens me that we know our immigrant story we know why we are a people as we are, and yet again and again and again we have such a hard time, it seems to me, when the immigrants don't quite look like us, don't quite sound like us, don't quite have the same religion as we do. Um, and yet, you know, for those of us who have participated as immigrants, I think we do develop such a, a, you know, such a profound respect for this country, uh, really profound. So with your Yale Law degree, you head back to Boston, is that right? I headed back to Boston and I had, the only thing I knew about law, really the only thing I knew about law, <coughs> was Perry Mason. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know what lawyers did other than Perry Mason. And of course I was going to be the great civil libertarian defense attorney representing all of those people who had been wrongly accused by the police and were being brought up on trumped up charges. I, that was my vision uh, of what was happening. And of course, this was the United States, not South Africa, so it doesn't quite work like that. And I went to work at the end of my first year for a wonderful, wonderful civil libertarian lawyer called Bill Holmans, William Holmans, great lawyer in Boston. And he was wonderful, and I hated criminal law. I just, there was, I mean, it just didn't fit. It just didn't fit. Um, and so then I was stuck, because I didn't know what else to do. And there was a wonderful new uh, firm, and one of my former partners, Paul McNamara, is sitting right here. Um, and I started doing, you know, what you do when you don't know what to do. You sort of, the recruiters come to law school and you just go and talk to them. And I always think, Paul, I hope you're not insulted that I selected Saplon and Bach because it was the one law firm where not every picture on the wall was a picture of ancient Boston. <laughs> and not everybody, every man who was wearing glasses had pink horn room glasses. I mean, here was this young firm, and I can remember we had exposed brick and purple walls, and I thought, now this is where you're going to practice laws. <laughs> and I had a wonderful time. Um, never thought that I would go into a commercial practice, but loved it. Just absolutely loved it. And obviously you were good at it. You became one of the best-known lawyers. I don't know how good I was at it, but you I loved it. You were head of the it. Boston Bar. Uh, yeah, I was head of the Boston First Bar. woman head of the Boston Bar. Or sure. I just loved it. I just loved it. And then I um, chose merged with Gaston Snow, and I ended up at another wonderful law firm. So, you know, looking back, I can see the, which piece led to another piece, but at the time, it felt very serendipitous. Um, very, very serendipitous.
and then Harvard snatched you up. Well, that was another, um, that, that was, there was an opening for the general counsel at Harvard. <clears throat> now, without going into too many details, do you remember I said I arrived on the campus in 1968 and the university went on strike in 1969 and I always hoped they didn't go back and look at the files in case they would find some photographs which were not so flattering. Um, and I went to Harvard because um, my practice was mostly intellectual property or really the practice of ideas. Boston is a wonderful city of ideas, so it's writers and scientists and so on. And that's mostly what I spent my time doing. And um, a wonderful mentor of mine, Jim Vorenberg, who uh, was at the time the dean of the Harvard Law School and who actually Jim married Tony and me, he's an old friend of Tony's, and Betty is here, sitting in the front row, um, called me one day and he said, um, have you, did you think about becoming the general counsel of Harvard? And I thought, oh, I don't think I want, I was very happy in the practice of law, but my practice was intellectual poverty and this was an opportunity to go and meet the then new president of Harvard. So if your practice is intellectual property, why wouldn't you want to go and meet the new president of Harvard? It's called rainmaking. <laughs> so I went into that interview with no intent. I was so happy in the practice of law. I really was. I loved it. And so I had no intention of leaving the practice of law and going to Harvard. And um, it was a wonderful interview. I remember it as if it were yesterday. <coughs> and I have an enormous respect for Neil Rubenstein. I think he will emerge as one of the great presidents of Harvard. And he and I just hit it off from the beginning. I remember the one kind of professional interaction that you and I ever had was during that period, 1993. I was the Chief Marshal of my 25th reunion, and uh, Colin Powell was named to be the main honoree of the upcoming Harvard commencement, and Don't Ask, Don't Tell had just come in. And I started getting phone calls from members of my class, the class of 68, men and women, coming out to me as gay men and lesbians saying, how can we come and enjoy our reunion that's honoring Colin Powell, who stands for exclusion of gays from the military. Of course, that's not why Harvard was honoring him. Harvard was honoring him for his great American life story, and it kind of was running off the rails. And all of this was very new to me. And my, I remember my uh, imperative was just to make people not feel excluded from their own college reunion. And I called you, and I said, help me figure this out. How can we how can we communicate to the gay and lesbian members of the Harvard community that no offense is meant and they should not feel excluded from this community? And, and you and Neil Rudenstein handled it really smartly. Do you, do you remember that? I remember, I mean, I remember the commencement because, so Colin Powell is the, Harvard doesn't announce its honorary degree recipients until the day except for the speaker. So this must have been in, February, January, February, when he was announced. It was Linda's 25th reunion. That's the class of 68. That's like the height of the anti-war movement. But it was also the 50th reunion of the greatest generation. So the, tw the 25 class were furious that we were giving it to a military person and to somebody who had just issued what they considered this horrendous policy the 50-year-old class were furious at the 25-year-old class <laughs> because didn't they understand what it meant to be, you know, uh, you know, the head of the Joint Chief of Staff? The black alumni, and faculty, and students were furious because this is the first time that there was going to be an African American <laughs> as the only degree speaker. I mean, we. Harvard, in a single stroke, had managed to touch hot buttons that just <laughs> ran across every way. And so part of what, uh, and I should say at that time, uh, we were not yet out of the HIV uh, AIDS fear period. And there was a rumor that um, some of the activists were going to 
a hide among the graduates and throw tainted blood at everybody. Um, I hadn't heard that. Um, you know, rumors are rumors. And so my task, it seemed to me, was to find a form of protest that would let everybody protest who wanted to protest, but at the same time let people who didn't want to protest not feel that the protesters were in their face uh, and feel that they could have a wonderful day. And the solution we came up with was for people who wanted to protest was to hold pink balloons. Now, we'd, be, we'd become accustomed to balloons, but that was one of the first times that we used balloons. <coughs> but they couldn't just be pink balloons. They had to be pink balloons of a certain length of string because you can imagine you just your child that you, on whom you've just spent $75,000 is just about to receive the diploma and this pink balloon is <laughs> right in your face. But it was a technical problem because Harvard's commencement is out of doors and they have those wonderful elm trees so the balloons couldn't be too long because they'd pop and they couldn't be too short, etc. I mean, it was wonderful. And the this most... This is what a Yale legal education <laughs> brings you. <laughs> and the most important thing was that the people who were leading the protest had to understand that it takes a long time to blow up thousands of balloons. You can't start at six in the morning. You needed a balloon consultant. <laughs> and so I remember the discussion saying to them, you have to get a balloon consultant. And of course they're balloon consultants. I mean, they run you know, our national political conventions and, they, you know, I mean, they, they're ter and they're terrific. They'll get you thousands of balloons. And it was such a wonderful celebration that it was a perfect day and there were thousands of pink balloons and nobody could take offense at pink balloons. And it was a, just a wonderful... Yeah, I mean, I, I bring that out just to show, you know, Margie Marshall in action, not, not the icon, <laughs> but somebody who really was confronted with a really tricky situation. And, and just a footnote, so, so, you know, my class was all up there on the, you know, the steps of Memorial Hall and uh, Memorial Church, and, and there was General Powell. And the, the backstory was at the lunch that precedes the coming on to the podium there. Uh, one of my classmates whom I had invited to the lunch showed up, um, this gay activist with banner and pink star David earrings and banners around his top hat and tails, and he went up to Colin Powell which was nervy, Colin Powell in his full four-star general uniform, and said, General Powell, I look forward to the day when this issue no longer divides us. Oh, and he didn't know whether Colin Powell would cut him dead or insult him or whatever, whatever. And instead, uh, General Powell embraced him with both arms and said, so do I, and I hope that day comes sooner rather than later. And so he put the word out, my classmate in his community, okay. And so when General Powell got up to speak, uh, some members of the class stood and kind of and turned their backs and they had the balloons. But it, it went, and Powell acknowledged them very graciously with a smile because he knew what was going on. And it, it turned out to be a kind of a, almost a coming together yeah. instead of a divisive and exclusion thing. It was a, it was a terrific experience. You know, Linda, as I listen to you, I realize and it, it really has been my experience in the United States that when we work together to find a solution, we do so much better than, we, than when we go at each other, you know, with no compromise, with, with just not listening. I mean, I didn't have a solution. I didn't come up with a solution. But by having thoughtful people with very, very different views and very strongly held views, but just listening and figuring out what it was that concerned them so much, I think... It always brings out the best, probably of all people, but it always seems to me it brings out the best of Americans. And it saddens me that we don't see quite enough of that. We see plenty of it, but not quite enough. Um, and I think of Colin Powell, who was such a wonderful leader, and I don't think he left that day without having, you know, every single person in that audience feeling good about him. There was another much more public moment, which was... And for those of you um, who are not familiar with the intricacies of the University of Glasgow River, there are always three student addresses. There's an undergraduate who speaks in Latin, 
And by the way, there's a translation on the program, so you should remember that if you ever go. Um, there's an undergraduate who speaks in English, and then there's a graduate who speaks in English. And the graduate who spoke in English that year made reference to the don't, tell, don't, don't ask, don't tell policy. And when she finished speaking, the, uh, General Powell stood up, he was sitting in the front row, and went across and shook her hand, and the place just erupted in applause. I mean, people understand, you know, when there are differences of opinion that you want to, you know, somehow find common ground. So that was 1993. Oh, and, Linda. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Ten years later uh, comes the Goodrich decision. I'm skipping a lot, but we, you, I think I'm skipping the part of Margie's story that <clears throat> I think most people here know, that is to say her judicial a career, we'll get back to that, but <clears throat> so 2003, you write as follows in Goodrich against Department of Public Health. I'm not going to read the whole opinion. Oh, thank heavens. <laughs> but I'll read the beginning of it. <coughs> marriage is a vital, <coughs> excuse me, marriage is a vital social institution. The exclusive commitment of two individuals to each other nurtures love and mutual support it brings stability to our society. For those who choose to marry and for their children, marriage provides an abundance of legal, financial, and social benefits. In return, it imposes weighty legal, financial, and social obligations. The question before us is whether, consistent with the Massachusetts Constitution, the Commonwealth may deny the protections, benefits, and obligations conferred by civil marriage to two individuals of the same sex who wish to marry. We conclude that it may not. The Massachusetts Constitution affirms the dignity and equality of all individuals. It forbids the creation of second-class citizens. In reaching our conclusion, we have given full deference to the arguments made by the Commonwealth, but it has failed to identify, but it has failed to identify any constitutionally adequate reason for denying civil marriage to same-sex couples. And you go on to say, barred access to the protections, benefits, and obligations of civil marriage, a person who enters into an intimate, exclusive union with another of the same sex is arbitrarily deprived of membership in one of our community's most rewarding and cherished institutions. That exclusion is incompatible with the constitutional principles of respect for individual autonomy and equality under law. And I think it's not too hard to see a direct trajectory from the young Margie Marshall, who you were recalling a few minutes ago, um, to those passages, or am I just being overly deterministic and, and, and romantic? No, I don't think you're being overly deterministic and romantic, but the, the wonderful thing about being a judge is that you really, you know, the case comes before you um, and then you listen to the arguments. And so the passage that you read that said the Commonwealth has failed to identify seemed to me that that was the crux of the problem. You have to remember that um, my colleagues and I were justices of the state Supreme Court. Um, and state Supreme Courts um, don't look to the nation or the world. We really don't. I mean, Justice Lee Brandeis, in a, in a well-known uh, opinion, once talked about state courts serving as laboratories, you know, that experiments were made, and if they work, other states will adopt them, and if they don't work, they won't adopt them. And all through its history, Massa <coughs> Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, like other state courts, has, you know, broken ground. Um, but we lived in a very different context in Massachusetts at that time. For example, it was legal for same-sex parents to adopt children. Uh, the state had authorized that. Uh, the state placed foster children with same-sex couples. There were a lot of foster children. And, and, there was a, and that was not the case, for example, in other states. In other states, if you, ha if you were the parent in a heterosexual marriage and you divorced and entered into a same-sex partnership, uh, some states provided that you automatically lost custody of your child. So that's a different state. We were dealing with Massachusetts. And I'm listening to what the Massachusetts Attorney General proffered as reasons for why the state should deny this. 
The other thing I think is important to remember is that um, over the course of time, <coughs> not originally, but over the course of time, the state had come to provide extensive benefits for married couples and their children. And so this was not the 17th century with states. I mean, essentially marriage was a private property relationship with very little, uh, and of course a religious uh, institution, but very little coming from the state. By the end of the 20th century in the United States, um, the status, status of marriage was probably one of the key you know, economic driving patterns for most families. So, you know, history comes in different ways. Um, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor, I'm sure you've heard her say this many times because she's asked so, many, so often whether it makes a difference to be, you know, a, a male judge or a woman judge, and that's a little bit like saying if it makes a difference to being a South African versus a non-South African. And her answer always was that a wise man and a wise woman judge will come to the same decision. You know, I was joined in my decision by three other people um, who weren't South Africans. They had very different backgrounds. Um, and um, the thing that I like most about that process is that, um, and I don't think I'm talking out of turn here, but the justices, all seven of us, worked very hard together. I worked with the lead dissenters, Justice Sossman, Justice Cordy, and Justice Fina, to make sure that people understood where it was that we differed, what the legal arguments were that differed. And so if you read the full set of opinions, I don't believe anywhere in any of the one, two, three, four, five opinions, I think there are five opinions, is there a negative slur made about another justice. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I'm sad to say that I've, I've seen other courts where that's not the case. It's almost as if they're ad hominem attacks from the one side or the other. And at the court, we tried very hard not to do that. And so uh, I have enormous respect for Justice Hossman. I do have a high regard for Justice Cordy and Justice Fina, and I could well understand um, what their legal arguments were. I just didn't agree with them. But I think that was always the, the, the feeling of the court, was to work very hard to find that commonality. We're going to open up to questions in a minute, but I don't want to end our conversation without giving you a chance to talk about the challenges facing the courts today. You were head of a state Supreme Court with an enormous history in the 1780s, in its first constitutional decision, the Supreme Judicial Court invalidated slavery, mm -hmm. the first court to do so. Uh, just a, a great tradition um, and a great court. But one facing, like other state courts in the country, enormous challenges, and, and you're devoting a chunk of your retirement energy to trying <coughs> to make sure people understand that and are able to function. Uh, productively with that knowledge. So I would just want to give you a chance to talk about that. Let me make three um, separate points. First is we are one nation and it doesn't surprise me that the New York Times employed Linda Greenhouse and before that my husband to cover the United States Supreme Court because the New York Times is a national paper and there are some stories about um, state courts but essentially the the news story is federal courts. So I want to give you one little statistic for you just to keep in your head when you read stories about this. Um, in 2008, which is the last year for which we have comparative data, if you took every case filed in every federal court in the United States, trial court, court of appeal, United States Supreme Court, every case filed, all those petitions for cert, all of those pro se petitions, excluding bankruptcy, there were about 387,500 cases filed in federal courts in 2008. And the number filed in state courts, trial, intermediate, and courts of last resort, Supreme Courts, excluding traffic, 48.5 million. So justice in the United States is delivered primarily through the state courts. 
So that's my first. The second is, I do think, and I know from experience, that we Americans want to live in and pride ourselves that we do live in a country um, where the rule of law is the overarching principle. We take that almost for granted. We are a government of laws and not of men. And that's what Americans want. They don't want to have an unjust society. They don't want, and I'm not going to point fingers at particular societies, but they don't want a system like South Africa where the courts did not protect people. The problem with the funding of courts is that there's a structural problem with the funding of state government. It's not that anybody's picking on the courts, it's that our system of funding state governments is broken. And there are powerful competing needs for education and for mental health and for the environment and for jobs and for safety and for transportation. But those are choices we have. The judiciary is a branch of government. And one way I like to explain it to friends is to say, you know, when Senator Edward Kennedy passed away, the governor could have said, you know, we're going to have another election in 2012. Why don't we just wait until then before we fill his seat? We'll send down Paul Kirk and he'll be, oh, he did a fine job. So why don't we just keep Senator Kirk there for 2000, rest of 2010, 2011, 2012? You know, you would have thought that the man was crazy. And yet we often treat the courts as if they are simply another commodity. I know from so deeply within me that what has made the United States a great, great, great nation, the longest living democracy in the history of the world, is because we have independent courts. So when the government does something to you, primarily, by the way, not your free speech rights or your freedom of religion rights, your property rights. Have you looked at the pictures of Shanghai? You know, when all those, that land was taken and all these skyscrapers, how many people do you think were justly compensated? I don't know, maybe they all were, but I am much more confident that when they try to take the land on the waterfront to build our house, federal, beautiful federal courthouse. You know, people were justly compensated. And that's our United States, and that's, I think, what is at risk, really seriously at risk. And so, I'm not a chicken little, I don't think the sky is falling in, but I think there is a fundamental problem if we don't fix the funding problem, because you just can't ask people, you know, to wait for two, three, four, five years to resolve a dispute. I think we will lose confidence in our system of government. I think the good thing is you will continue to have a platform for, for getting that. <laughs> I'm supposed to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. So my marching orders are to save this time for <laughs> I used to say you could ask me any question, I wouldn't be able to answer all of them. I don't sort of, you know, because so many cases I couldn't talk about when I was a judge, but I'll exercise my discretion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are microphones. How did you meet Tony Lewis? <laughs> Amy, you want the real story? <laughs> I'll tell you exactly how I met Tony Lewis, um, and I know, we know exactly when we met for this reason. Um, I was living in Cambridge. Um, I had just started law school in the fall of 1973, and there was a great South African barrister, Sidney Kentridge, who was visiting at the Harvard Law School. Um, uh, Sidney Kentridge um, was one of Nelson Mandela's key attorneys uh, in, the, in the trial that sent uh, President Mandela to prison. And Tony uh, had just returned from being the New York Times correspondent in London. Um, because he had been the New York Times correspondent in London, he had written about South Africa in a way that made sense to me because, <coughs> as I said, most Americans knew very little about South Africa. People in England knew quite a lot about South Africa. 
And it seemed to me that Tony always got it dead right. He understood that the issue in South Africa was not a black-white issue, it was a power issue. Who was going to control all the economic and social and political power? Very, very wealthy country. And the Kensages had finished their semester at Harvard and they were having a little champagne and dessert dinner. And unusually for Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02138. I do live there and I do love Cambridge, but you know, sometimes Cambridge does think it's the center of the universe. In any event, uh, unusually for this evening, the television set was on. You never have a television set on in Cambridge, right? <laughs> and the reason the television set was on was um, the then president of the United States, President Nixon, was going to announce who his new vice president was going to be after Vice President Agnew had resigned in rather awkward circumstances. I had never met Anthony Lewis. I just knew about his writing. And, um, you know, at a certain point, hail to the chief came and President Nixon came before the cameras and said, my fellow Americans, I'm denied, delighted to announce that my next vice president will be Gerald Ford. And collectively, this group of people in Cambridge said, who's Gerald Ford? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had heard of this Republican congressman from Michigan. And there was a man standing in the corner, and he said, oh, I know General Ford. Ford, he's an extremely decent man, and I think he'll make a fine vice president. And I turned to the person next to me, and I said, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> that was Tony Lewis. <laughs> so we know when we met, uh, <laughs> Amy. Yeah. Uh, yes. I wonder if... Uh, you could tell us what you think of the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa, how successful it was, and if it, there, if what, if anything, we can learn about um, justice in the United States from that. Sure. Let me just tell those of you who don't know the truth and reconciliation was a process that was established in the wake of the end of the apartheid regime, and essentially, and I really am simplifying, um, what the Clinton group truth and reconciliation process involved was if you had committed what we would think of as crimes, murder, rape, whatever it was, blowing up buildings, blowing up people, in pursuit of a political objective, and you could both establish that it was a crime in pursuit of a political objective, and if you were fully truthful and honest about everything that had happened, then it was possible to be granted amnesty for the crimes that had been committed. <coughs> and you had to come forward and you had to testify publicly about the acts in which you had been engaged. But it's important to remember that it had to be in pursuit of a political goal. In other words, the, the security police had ordered you to torture somebody and you had to be completely truthful. Um, the, the quick answer to your question is I think it was enormously successful, enormously successful, and we can learn from it. One of the things that I think made it so successful is that people want to know what happened to family members who have disappeared. All of us want to know that. And we have, for example, um, you know, the reason why the MIA movement has gone on for so long or the Armenian genocide movement still continues to rankle so much is because people feel that they don't know what happened and I think that was enormously positive. Um, it was the, the, the chair of the commission was Archbishop Desmond Tutu who is an extraordinary human being and I think that what we learned from that is that you need somebody who won't just be a judge taking evidence. I mean, the archbishop would stop and weep as he listened. I mean, he humanized the proceedings. I think the drawbacks are hard for people to hear that a child or a husband or a parent has been tortured to death. I mean, in the most brutalizing kinds of ways and to know that that person is being given amnesty. The difficulty if you have new democracies if you want to punish people for the acts that they have committed, even if they are political acts, you can't, the state cannot punish without due process of law. And due process of law means that you've got to have all the things that we have in our courts. You must have a right to counsel. You don't have to testify um, against yourself. You know, there's a fair proceeding. And those take forever. 
forever. And so I think what this did was permit South Africa to move forward, not without some lots of residual pain, but essentially say, we know what happened. And it was riveting. This was on national television, night after night after night, of people learning what their government had done. Um, so I think that the pieces are there. Could one think of improvements? Probably yes. But I think the basic architecture had a, a profoundly important, positive beginning. Of course, what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did not deal with, with was the huge disparity of socioeconomic rights where the black population had essentially, as part of the apartheid system, had lost their land, lost their homes, denied education, denied health care rights. That the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did not deal with. It dealt with what you and I would think of as sort of individual um, hurts, hatreds and hurts. And I think if there's anything, if you're trying to set up a new society like South Africa, um, I think that, that the next Truth and Reconciliation Commission should probably look at those things as well. Yeah. You spoke very movingly of the fact that in, within this state, uh, justice comes very slowly. What are the problems that you see nationally or internationally that are structural or could be, um, you know, a systemic problem that truly needs to be dealt with in, in the same way? In, in our justice system? Well, certainly funding helps. I mean, you have to have adequate funding. Um, I think when I became the Chief Justice, what I realized was um, that we, in a I hope I'm not being too harsh, but I used to say, I, you know, I had to cancel the order for quill pens. We hadn't really embraced modern ways of running institutions. And one of the things my colleagues and I did was to establish, under the wonderful help of Father Donald Monan from Boston College, um, a group of people who had largely experience in the business world to help us come in and look at our systems. That was a little unusual for a Chief Justice to do, and it wasn't just me, I was working with my colleagues. Um, and at the time, we received some criticism. You know, we do justice, we don't manufacture widgets. And I said, yes, but there's lots that we can learn. And one of the things we started looking at was simply collecting data. Um, in many of our courts, our probate and family court, docket, cases being filed and the dockets were being entered by hand. You can't manage that. And we started looking at when did a case start and when did it finish from the litigant's point of view? So take, for example, a case of a conviction of murder in the first degree. When was the homicide and when did the Supreme Judicial Court issue its final decision? And we discovered that it was sometime in seven, eight, nine years. Why? Not because people weren't working, uh, but we discovered a very little interesting thing. The case was tried in the Superior Court. We have wonderful Superior Court judges, and the jury would return a verdict of guilty, and from the Superior Court's point of view, that case was finished. But Massachusetts unusually had a funny little rule that said the case didn't start in the appeals court until the trial transcript had been prepared. So, from the Supreme Judicial Court, we didn't have the case. Right? So we didn't worry that we were getting behind. The case hadn't arrived. And what was holding it up? Well, it turned out to be the preparation of transcripts, but nobody was watching that. And so what we all learned was if you shine a light on and see where the clenches in the system are, you can actually begin to get all parts of the system working together. It sounds very boring, but I really do believe that justice delayed is justice denied. From the prosecutor's point of view, it was tolerable because if you indicted for murder in the first degree and convicted of murder in the first degree, you're in prison, so there was no problem of safety to the community. From the defendant's point of view, um, well, before trial, you have many, many more privileges because you presumed innocent. 
and if the appeal takes a long time, you never know, you may get the benefit of some new law that's developed. And so who was getting left out of that picture? The victim and the victim's family. And the courts were really looking at the lawyers and the, and the parties and not what were the peripheral effects. Similarly, in family court, you know, the, the dispute was between, you know, the mother and the father or the two parents, and nobody was really thinking about the child. I mean, not from the court's point of view. The parents might have been, but from the court's point of view. So the question, you just turn the, you turn the spotlight just a little, and then you work with people throughout the system to improve it. Um, things like buildings. Most, we have 106 courthouses in Massachusetts, 106. Most of them were built in the 19th century. A lot of them were built in the 19th, not most, but a lot of them were built in the 19th century. And you know them all, they're beautiful in your little town. And what do they all have, the four little steps up the front? Just four little ones? One, two, three, four? I mean, if you're in a wheelchair, they might as well be 40 steps. So how you modernize those. Um, a lot of people were moving forward when they couldn't hear me. Have you ever sat in a Massachusetts courtroom at the back? You can't hear a thing. Because people didn't think about that. We were all getting old and a little deaf. Um, I mean, th so there are just lots of things that you can do to make the actual delivery of justice. I think the wonderful thing is Massachusetts has really terrific judges, trial judges, appeals court judges. And so what I heard when I traveled around the Commonwealth is once we get in front of a judge, it's fine. It's just getting in front of the judge. Now, if you think about if you're becoming a new chief justice, which problem would you rather have? It's very efficient, but boy, are those judges corrupt. Uh-uh, you don't want that problem. You want to say the justice is good, but it takes a little longer. You can fix the longer problem. Yes, sir. Thank you for your service. Uh, do you still have family in South Africa? And if so, would you still be arrested if you went to visit? <laughs> I do have family in South Africa. Um, I have my brother and a whole raft of uh, aunts. Well, I've actually only got one aunt who's surviving and cousins and so on. And no, uh, my husband and I go quite freely. Um, after 1990 and after, Mon <coughs> after Nelson Mandela was released, released from prison and things changed, I could go back. And one of the great privileges of retirement is that Tony and I were able to go to South Africa for six weeks uh, this spring, um, February, March, not a good time to be in Boston, wonderful time to be down south, <laughs> uh, and we had a wonderful time, and I hadn't been in South Africa for that long since I left in 1968, so we had a wonderful time. And it, 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 just to elaborate a little, South Africa has this fledgling, new, spectacular democracy, lots of problems but a wonderful constitutional court and a rule of law if, you know, the constitutional court issues judgments that the president doesn't like and the president obeys them. Huge, huge achievement in South Africa. Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, I asked this question with a little bit of trepidation, but I tremendously respect um, your magnificent mind and wisdom, so I'd like to hear your opinions about this. Um, President Carter has called what's happening in the Palestinian territories apartheid. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, I believe, has said it's worse than the apartheid system that was in South Africa. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts you could share with us about that one, too, since we as uh, Americans are so heavily, intensely involved in what's happening there, if you have any um, suggestions or thoughts about what we in this country might do. And three, if at some point in time it might be possible for some form of truth and, uh, truth and reconciliation to play some kind of healing role there. Thank you very much. Um, it, I'm a little, it, it, it's not my area of expertise, but I will try to answer it in this way. First of all, um, with Tony, I've managed, I've been fortunate to go to Israel and Palestine um, several times, not many, many times, maybe half a dozen times over a period of time. And I'll tell you something at my expense first. I have a very bad ear for languages, very bad. And Tony would laugh that we would get into a taxi 
and the taxi driver will be talking on the radio phone. This is in Jerusalem. And I'd lean over to Tony, I'd say, Jewish or Arab? <laughs> because I couldn't tell the difference. So the first impression that you can't understand the language is everybody looks the same. I mean, absolutely everybody looks the same. And so my first answer is it just saddens me enormously that this people, you know, who have so much in common and who must be so closely interwoven and interlinked. So um, there is enormous sadness there. I just didn't understand it. The second thing for those of you who haven't had the wonderful privilege of going to Jerusalem is that I always found it fascinating that these three great religions, and there are probably some others, but certainly uh, Judaism, uh, Christianity, and the Muslim religions, all, it's not just Boston, it's not just the Kennedy Library where they think they have their toehold, it is like this platform. This is where Muhammad's horse went up to heaven. This is where the Temple of David was. And this is where Christ was crucified, all within this 10 square feet. So you feel that religious intensity powerfully. Third, I think that the political solutions or lack of solutions pay no attention to that. They are so, there's so little communication. Um, and we have friends who are Palestinians and we have friends who are Jewish and we have friends who are Christian who all live in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or you know, parts of the West Bank and I think the people with whom we feel the most closest are, feel about as painful as any group of people that I know anywhere in the world. They just feel as if the, the chances of peace you know, are just disappearing in front of their eyes. Of course, there's a peculiar tragedy because as you watch the events that are happening throughout that region, the pieces that on which Israel could rely, can't rely on so much anymore, a stable Egypt. Um, I mean, it's, it's a tiny, tiny country. Uh, so I think that I don't have any advice for people in the United States who feel so deeply committed to either Israel or to an independent Palestinian state. I do think um, it's urgent that people learn to talk together and that's why I think even the little fledgling organizations of mothers on both sides whose children have been killed or young musicians, uh, Daniel Barenboim's work that he's doing with music, I think that those are the kinds of things uh, that we just have to foster and support. You know, I'll finish with the wonderful statement from Robert Kennedy about, you know, if, if every person stands up, you know, speaks out against injustice, and just, you just take one tiny little step, you know, sends forth a tiny ripple of hope that, you know, collectively from all over will, you know, um, you know, can bring down the Great Depression. That has been my life. I mean, what I was doing in South Africa was so little, was so little, and yet collectively it all made a difference in the long run. And so for the people of Israel and the people of Palestine, I would say, do whatever you can to keep talking and to see the other as, as human as you are. And um, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, somewhere in the future, there will be peace in that region. Thanks very much. Good, good note to end on. Thank you. Thank you so much.